cooperatives are democratically run organizations in which members have an equal call on assets and on any surplus. And beyond their own organization, members are committed to the wider community and to supporting other cooperative businesses. In other words, cooperatives create community wealth. Cooperatives are also an international movement committed to the principles of the International Cooperative Alliance. And their origins just lie just down the road, for those of you who, who are joining us from Lancashire, in Rochdale, of course. So for all these reasons, cooperatives deserve our attention as we seek to build back better from COVID. In this first webinar, our focus is on cooperatives for workers in the digital and creative economy. We know the sector has boomed during the pandemic as so much has shifted from the physical to the virtual realm, just like the webinar today. But as share prices have rocketed to the benefit of shareholders, how has the digital workforce fared? Does company profit translate into improved pay, terms and conditions for workers? Or would a different cooperative model of doing business offer workers greater autonomy? A, a fairest share of the fruits of their labour and a sense of being part of an international movement committed to transforming how we live and work. To provide some answers to these questions, we have with us today the wonderful speakers, three wonderful speakers who are all digital professionals and members of cooperative businesses which sell tech and digital services. John Evans is a co-founder of Co Code Operative, a non-profit service cooperative of freelance software developers based in the Northeast. Code Operative bridges the gap between freelancers and the businesses that need them. Our second guest is Mark Porter, a founder member of the Preston Digital Foundation, a unique collaboration between staff, graduates, current students and freelancers at the University of Central Lancashire. The foundation provides innovative solutions to real world problems and is a worker owned cooperative. Our last speaker is Polly Robbins from Digital Co-op Outlandish, which runs a, work, a co-op working space called Space4 in London. Polly is also part of CoTech, a national network of cooperatives that sell tech and digital services. CoTech aims to create a better technology sector in the UK that focuses primarily on worker, customer, and end user needs, rather than on generating private profit. Before we start, a couple of bits of housekeeping. As Alina has said, please could you keep your cameras and mics switched off and your name and organization displayed on the screen. We are going to record today's seminar, webinar, which will be edited, edited and posted online and we'll let you know when it's available as soon as possible. Each speaker will talk for around 15 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of questions. So do put your questions in the chat and I'd invite the, our speakers to respond to them or I can prompt them as well and pick up questions as they come in at the end. Finally, just before we get into the heart of today's event, I want to say a big thank you to the Lancashire Forum Creative who have helped promote today's event. Lancashire Forum Creative is a leadership and business development programme that is tailored to meeting the learning and development needs of Lancashire's creative and digital small and medium sized enterprises. Laurie Smith, programme director, is going to say a couple of words about the forum before I ask John to begin the webinar. Thank you, Laurie. Thanks very much, Rachel. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Great to see you. Uh, I'm just going to quickly uh, share my screen so that show you a couple of slides. I'm really not going to uh, hog the mic for too long because um, the main event is uh, is what you what you're all here for. Oops, sorry, let's, let's slip forward. Right, okay. So, yes, thanks, Rachel. So, as Rachel said, Lancashire Forum Creative uh, is an SME leadership uh, and development program. Um, and we um, are, uh, our participants are all from Lancashire and they're all creative and digital SMEs. Uh, we're currently for, funded by uh, the uh, EIDF, uh, the EU, so 
Um, all the, the assistance is uh, free at the point of delivery for, for uh, the, the people who we work with. I think I even see a few familiar faces in the, uh, the, uh, the list here. So it's great to see you again if you've worked with us before. So I'm just going to say a little bit about what we do. So, yeah, I mean, it's basically about bringing SMEs together. And I mean, today is all about cooperation, cooperatives um, and uh, in the digital world. Um, and we have, uh, over the last three or so years, uh, we've worked with more than 125, uh, or we've in fact assisted more than 125 um, SMEs from, from across the county. And that includes co-ops and social enterprises and so on. So the things that we do, you know, we're, we're here to address isolation because running a business, running a small business, uh, people often uh, talk of, of feeling isolated and definitely more than ever now um, with the uh, the whole COVID situation and working from home and um, being kind of separated from the people we work with. So that's, you know, something very important and that's something we've been trying to address through the forum. Um, and... The work we do, um, we aim to increase productivity, uh, to address the isolation, to, to, to enable people to develop, develop their businesses in the right way for them. But it's really about starting conversations and building relationships, which could then lead on to collaboration and cooperation. So everything has to start with a conversation. And uh, what we're really excited about doing is bringing people together and laying the ground for great things to happen. Um, so the way we do it, so everything's based on um, social learning. So we really value the expertise and the experience of the people we work with. So everything we do kind of is based on a peer-to-peer -peer learning approach with some expert and uh, kind of uh, academic input as well. But um, it's really, really valuing the knowledge that the uh, SME leaders hold. Um, so we do all sorts of exciting, creative and innovative things. We've done Lego Serious Play. Uh, we go to see other companies who uh, show us how to do it properly or kind of or we get to see behind the scenes, if you like. Uh, obviously, less of that's been going on during COVID, but um, everything that we do, we try and do online as well. So we've been doing design sprints. We run action learning sets. Again, kind of really tapping into the peer-to-peer uh, the -peer learning side of things. Uh, and the other side of things we do is uh, our, our think tanks. And so this is where we collaborate with um, people from industry, from academic college, from across the university, from other organisations. Um, and some examples of this are um, well, our upcoming think tanks. So um, these are very much a collaborative approach. So a shameless plug here, but um, some upcoming events that you might be interested in are um, a technology toolkit examination. Uh, so we're looking at if the tools that you're using are right for you and you know, if there are anything else that you could be using. So that's the 11th of May. And these are held in conjunction with Digital Lancashire, these ones. Then we're going to be looking at uh, ways to collaborate, which obviously is a pertinent topic for today. So that's 1st of June. And then looking at what the future might hold, that's on the 29th of June. So these are all um, in conjunction with Digital Lancashire, uh, collaborating with them and bringing in various experts uh, to enliven those events. And then also, final shameless plug, um, is the Array Festival, which is being held in Lancaster, um, so again, this is an online festival this time around, and we're um, lucky enough to be working with uh, the outdoor clothing and um, shoe company Innovate, uh, who are based up in Kendall. Uh, so they're going to be coming along and telling us all about their innovative practices in terms of marketing and um, uh, new shoe design. So that's my shameless plug. Um, thank you for uh, giving me that time, Rachel and Alina. So, yes, our email address, if you'd like to know any more, lanksforum at uplan.ac.uk, and uh, we can tell you lots more all about it. So I'll hand back to you guys and have a great afternoon. Cheers. Thanks very much, Laurie. That was really helpful, and I'm sure a lot of interest in many of the events you were, you were presenting there. Well, without any, more, oh, any further ado, I'd like to hand over to John to begin today's webinar, Digital Co-ops Now. Cool, hello. Uh, I'm just going to press present there. Cool. All right, so uh, thanks, Rachel. Uh, thanks, everyone else, uh, for coming. So uh, my name's John. I'm from a co-op called Code Operative. Um, we specialize in making uh, apps and websites, generally for um, charities, other co-ops, or someone 
who wants to improve the world. We generally make um, the big thing we seem to make is like mapping software. So if people want to declare an emergency or explore land around them and land ownership, we do um, things like that. Um, I am a front end, mainly a front end developer, but also do some some project management and some uh, business development. Uh, cool. Uh, right. So what is what is digital corp? So essentially. Um, uh, a corp belongs. A corp is a company um, where the the workers own that company, um, and the decisions are made by the workers themselves. Um, the at the at the core of it, it's a, a group of people who've decided to work together, and everyone sharing in the proceeds of their work, and then everything else. Um, is downstream of that. So the the legal company rules, um, the clients that you have, the other networks the organization is part of, all flows from the central thing of a group of people who've decided that they want to work with each other and share 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 in the output uh, themselves and decide exactly what they want to do and create their own boundaries for that. Um, so it's, an, it's, it's a very simple idea. Um, there's a long history of co-ops in this country. Um, most co-ops that people are familiar with are consumer co-ops, um, where people are buying buying together rather than selling together. Um, but it works in a it works in a similar way. Um, the just because it's simple to describe doesn't mean it's like simple in practice. So when you um, who, the, the person who makes the decisions, um, it's it's everyone, and as you add more people, it does get sort of more complicated trying to accommodate preferences and what people will tolerate. Um, and in a, it, when, you, when you're a worker in a normal company, the boundaries are quite strict. Um, what happens is what people you know, tell you what happens. You can negotiate a bit with your boss or your uh, teammates, but you don't have uh, very much control over it. So you're, the, the framework is quite limited. You can choose where you can have a, a choice in like who you apply for and where you want to work. Um, but not much in terms of like one, once you're there, you have to stick quite strongly to the to the hierarchy that's in place. Um, Co-ops generally um, manage this by break, breaking the tasks up and then assigning it to like individuals or people um, or, or groups and try to generally try to rotate the ro rotate the roles. So there'll be some kind of some kind of framework people interact in, whether that's you know formally formally and explicitly written down or whether it's sort of implicit and. Uh, it's kind of an oral culture is up again, another decision that's sort of up to the co-ops. Um, cool. So here are the here are the promised benefits. So not not having a boss is uh, great. Um, there's no uh, sort of uh, there's not really sort of an arbitrary I don't know arbitrary time to come in or arbitrary sort of uh, uh, dress code you had to have. Um, you still have responsibilities to the people you work with and you have to sort of set your boundaries and work on the boundaries of, with other people. But um, that is pretty much the, the best thing. Like I don't have to uh, imagine the psychology of a person who sort of has uh, control over like the way in my livelihood, uh, which is extremely freeing. If, uh, uh, if you've been in those kind of, kind of situations where you can, uh, where you don't have much autonomy over what's going on. Um, the next part is about, so that's sort of an individual level. The rest of it is about um, the group. So it's basically the um, the freedom to be to be with each other, um, to uh, experience other people's sort of authentic selves in the same way that you're uh, displaying your own. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the biggest benefit is that you own the company, so you get to you get to keep the money that you make. Uh, you get to decide how to use it along with everyone else. Um, and there's not some, there's not an owner somewhere that is sort of extract, extracting the value. So you can either earn more money um, doing the same job, or you can earn the same amount of money and do less work, which are both attractive options, I think. Um, so that's more, so more about corps, and this is about how does sort of digital and corps fit together. Um, the the reason it's a good fit uh, for this moment is that in most digital companies have a low uh, capital cost relative to labor. So if you're already freelancing, the capital cost is quite small. Um, you've already bought the equipment that you need. And most um, most technology, um, at least in the at least in the, the sort of business world that I exist in, is open source. 
um, and just a, a, available to use and install. And the, the the sort of bottleneck is like expertise, right? Which is the, the sort of the thing that we're providing. Um, the other thing I would say is that the trend for technology has been towards uh, things like uh, the agile methodology, um, where the the way the work is done is supposed to be sort of without without a hierarchy of uh, of status of of people who are like sort of ranked by importance deciding things. It's about like analyzing the the problem itself and then allowing that to determine um, the work that gets done. Uh, so if you don't have, if there isn't, rather than having a sort of formal, like an, an, an ownership system where there are people who are, you know, who are materially obviously more important and trying to sort of mash that together with a system where the, the only important thing is the work, you, you can start from that position. It makes it, it makes it very easy to do agile um, in my, in my experience. Um, yeah, the, on, on transparency, the the co-op aspect, I think, moves moves you towards being transparent about um, about uncertainty um, with clients. I think it, I think it makes it easier to do that because you are you're sort of there's no there's no benefit within the co-op in hiding information really um, and sort of revealing it at strategic times. The Within a co-op, the, um, the, the, the because the material interests of everyone are sort of presumed to be the same, um, there's not the sort of antagonism between an uh, the uh, like an employer and employee. Um, the you get used to sort of sharing information in a in a free way um, and saying this is how this is how long we expect things to take. Um, the the the, the work is the work, right? It's, it's this complicated, it'll take us this long, therefore it costs this much. Um, the other transparency is around like, like skills and like projects um, in terms of like, if, the, if, if this, does this team have this skill, rather than sort of uh, lying or sort of faking it, faking it until you make it kind of thing, um, there's no incentive for a, a project manager to say, yes, my team had, my team has this skill within the cup, if it doesn't, because everyone uh everyone is in trouble if that if that happens um it's you have the, the 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 incentives are basically aligned with um sort of a more transparent and open way of working um cool so i'm going to do some some of some of the challenges uh that i've come across in my core things and then i will cover some more cover some more ground so um the challenges. So this is about clients. So basically, how do you how do you find clients in your digital co-op? I mean, it's the same way as similar kind of way as people find clients in normal companies, right? So um, we used to go to a lot of events. That was uh, that was one way. We haven't been able to do that. We haven't found it to be as productive at the moment because it's not. It's hard to do um, cross talk and meeting people um, like we used to. Um, and people, people, people don't. Yeah, the the in person aspect seems to work quite, seems to work quite well. Seems to be quite important. Um, but generally, like st like starting any business, you find clients based on what you've you know the, the history of the people you've already you've already worked with, um, and sort of normal marketing rules apply. Um, although what we what we've tend to found is that the the co op the co op aspect is a selling point. Um, if you can lead with the lead with the transparency and lead with you know the people that the people that the people that you work with or hire through us are going to be happy you know working on the project um and uh you know you can you can trust them there's no sort of like, like co coercive relationship or anything happening um it, it it does it i found it does relax clients and it does make it easier to talk to them um we've also found that uh other co-ops are very sort of friendly and opening um with sort of the how we're sharing how they get clients for example we did um uh we joined in a bidding process at the start of this year and the information about how to join those join that bidding process and and work on it and like um sharing tips on it all came through this sort of co-op community uh that we're part of um yeah so it is so it is it is it is 
mostly like running a normal company in terms of like finding clients, but there's advantages to having to having co-ops. One of them being that every it's everyone working there has an incentive to bring in bring in new clients, right? So rather than it just being the the contacts of uh, the owner or the sales team or whatever, you have everyone working there is able to be an ambassador for the for the co-op. Uh, the next one is like sort of resolving differences. So this is, this is um, about disagreeing, right? So the the one of the key skills is being able to disagree with people in like a productive way um, and to express, to sort of figure out for yourself what you want by yourself and then with a group of people and sort of try to negotiate and navigate away to something that everyone can, if not be happy with, at least live with for the time being. Um, and this is this is uh, not easy, um, and it relies on skills that you might not have had to use before in um, in a company. But that's part. That's like the, the the flip side of the autonomy is it coming with like responsibility, right? So the stuff that managers are typically doing, like negotiating with their uh, with their team or other managers, or or trying to sort of um, create sense out of the difficultness of reality is the stuff that you have to do or you know get to do like this is this is why it's exciting to run a business or to or what people get out of being an entrepreneur is to lot like long term see the effects of your actions and sort of build on what you've already built on before um and you know reflect and grow as like a you know a human being um being in a cop does it means you cover more perspectives so in my in my in my experience it's slower to make decisions but the decisions are generally a higher quality because you brought in brought in more people who can like sort of um talk about their experiences and spot spot possible problems or things that might go wrong um my only tip would be try to set a time horizon at the start of discussing decisions and say like right we want to make the best decision for the next three months or we want to make the best decision for the year or something like that um just because it limits it to thinking about sort of out there out there scenarios and and like ex extremely long-term problems that you can sort of you can deal with later on and if you try to stick to sort of the material reality as much as possible so rather than saying is this is this fair and is this going to be just and and uh you know uh, environment like um uh, worthy or morally good you know forever trying to say can we deal can we live with this for the next three months like is is this going to make the people in this room and potentially some other stakeholders who aren't in this room is it going to satisfy them to do to do this basically um yes the another one is sort of if, if, if it is everyone's responsibility sometimes it can end up being like no one's responsibility for some for some of them sort of more boring things like um dealing with uh, i don't know taxes or regulations or filling in forms or uh answering a difficult a difficult email or whatever um in general the only solution is this is sort of communicate about it and make sure that people have people make sure people have the information um you check you know ch check check in with each other quite regularly um and just make sure that people people know what's going on they have an interest in not making everyone do it um and this is part of the part of the boundary setting that I mentioned uh, a bit earlier. Um, yeah, the final one is about culture. So it's like how if you 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 collectively are in control of, of the culture, right? As a as a whole, as a group. Um, this is the, the starting point for the co-op is is this group and how you interact with each other. And even if there's you know various. Mm -hmm interactions with other organizations like projects that go projects that become difficult or um i don't know some people leave or join the group or whatever uh the culture is what determines like whether it is working or not i mean even if you have a very uh a very strange legal uh situation from your from your company rules or something the the, the end result it is it is the culture that determines what happens um the, the thing the the way the tools like legal or technical tools are used to communicate or get things done come come from the culture that you have initially um and yeah it's a, it, it can be challenging if you don't pay attention to it and it can sort of advance out of your control and in, in from an individual perspective uh, if you have a co-op that is more than you know 
more than two people or more than three people, you don't really have a lot of control over it um, as it exists. You, do, you, can, you can control what you put into it, but you sort of you do have to have a lot of trust in the people that um, that you're with. So part of it is like making sure that you start with starting with people that you trust uh, makes this a lot a lot easier and a lot less risky. Um, and making sure that people are like sort of depositing into the into the culture over time or like um, building up a reserve of good times is quite important. That's something we've just we've discovered during COVID is that um, lockdown made doing social events very difficult. And um, if without most of people, most people's interactions became just solely about work um, with each other. And that means that they because they sort of start to associate the other people with just disagreements rather than with like you know it's a full a full human being with like other ways that you can connect with them like maybe I uh, disagree with the back end developer over you know how how we're managing the API or how we're like dealing with the data system that we're using but I, I outside the court like we have a lot of shared interest that we both like video games or that or that kind of thing. Um, but we're not we're not talking about that. We're, we're only sort of seeing each other and arguing all the time. Um, so that is something that needs to be managed, um, and it can be quite annoying. Um, however, there are people who can help you manage it, right? So um, there's a lot of networks out there to join, and people are, in my experience, have been very generous with their time um, helping other co-ops um, because we don't see the sector as sort of adversarial. Um, more more co-ops um eventually does mean like more clients coming more clients coming in as well because the the role of a co-op is to sort of generate clients and generate the business like sort of um highlight the business model and sort of move things in that sort of cooperative direction right sort of what the community wealth building thing is about and there are a lot of the lot of co-ops there are a lot of networks out there there are a lot of co-ops of co-ops out there so there's the International Cooperative Association. Um, there's uh, Kotec that Polly's will be talking about. Um, there's Factic in Argentina. There's a variety of co-ops and sort of organizations in North America um, and Happy Dev in France and that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, in general, if you if you don't make too big of an ask and just sort of check in regularly and sort of ask ask for tips, ask for help, um, people are very willing and and capable of giving it to you so it's worth it's worth get, it's worth getting in touch they're not very guarded they're not like guarded with the information and, and skills um cool all right so i'm gonna i'm gonna take questions now i've deliberately given quite because my the scope is quite wide i thought i would try and take a lead of what the, the things are to talk about from this so if you have a specific question that's great if you just have a topic you want to hear more about um that is great too rachel could you let me know how much time i have left this. Yeah, we've got about 10 minutes for questions and there have been two in the chat. Shall I read those out? Uh, yeah, that'd be great. So from Peter Hargreaves, yep. do the workers have equity? Is it one person, one vote? In which case, would new entrants have equal say as those who are well established in the cooperative? Cool. All right. I'll do the question in order. So do the workers have equity? Uh, it depends. Um, if you, the way my, my co-op is a uh, private company limited by guarantee. Um, so the, uh, there is an equity to be had basically. Um, the, the co-op doesn't have uh, shares to sort of buy and sell. However, there are co-ops that, um, that do, uh, that do work that way. So you can have a, you can have a, um, uh, you can have a co-op that one every, every member owns one share, um, and then those share that that uh, you can't sell the shares, but you 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 can sell the shares back to the co-op, and then people leave uh, when when you leave. Or you can, if you want, a co-op could uh, could have equity that sort of grow that like grows in value. Um, but some 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 co-ops like say the the equity the share that you have will always cost 100 pounds basically right so you have to you have to buy in when you join and you get that money back when you leave um and that serves as that that the reason to do that would be to have a sort of have a chunk of capital at the start um that you can that you can use to invest in um is it one person one vote it can be so you can if the court decides 
you know that's how the that's how we want to run our system is a sort of majority vote um you can do that if you want to use a sort of consensus or consent based decision making where it's like um uh one where it's rather than you know having a sort of first past the post style vote you can have does does everyone does that is there anyone who would block this from going forward like can everyone tolerate this um in general the court model works best when uh when it is sort of equal so when everyone is putting in a similar amount of work and getting out a sort of similar amount of thing um yeah and then peter peter's final question would new entrants have an equal say of those that are well established um so what we do is we have a kind of probationary period so we generally work with someone for about three to six months um on a project before um we would offer them uh, full membership so we have a sort of associate member status and then if we if we sort of trust people and we go like this person makes sort of makes reasonable decisions then we'd invite them to be a full member at that point they uh formally do have an equal say to those that are well established but the uh the informal aspect is like making sure they have the confidence to to bring up their ideas and challenge people when they when they do that um hopefully that's helpful peter if you want to if i've missed anything out feel free to ask again i suppose uh Carl, from Jerry. Carl, Anthony. Yeah. Sure. How um, do you balance the main benefits of agile practices with the inherent design by committee style of a cooperative model? Uh it's quite easy. You just we hand out roles to people. So on a project, it's you can just go this if action someone and go, right, this person is UX designer, you go off and work up work out with the client like what you want. Um, um so I'd say defining if you don't want if you don't want to sort of default into a design by committee style, or even if you if you have someone who has very strong opinions and you don't want them to sort of dominate the proceedings, um, just make sure you define it at the start and say here is here is what people are responsible for, um, and here is here is where I would like the decision to lie. So let's say I want I would like these two people who seem to know the most about it to go away and bring back a proposal that we can either accept or reject rather than um rather than having everyone working on it all the time that might be a better way to use use your time um yeah so it doesn't okay. so it, i wouldn't say it's i wouldn't say it's an an inherent thing that the court model presents but it's um uh yeah it can it can happen john we've got a question about code operative itself now yeah. I, you've only got a couple of minutes so i don't know whether okay, you can sure. really I can read it so I know it says, how long has it been going now um two years start well we started nearly nearly three we started uh, the group formed in july 2018 and then we legally incorporated and i've had clients from november 2018 um how many people are part of the co-op um we have nine full members and Four associate members at the moment and how has this changed the life of the court yes we started with um four full members and now we have more than that um why don't we use the dot corp domain um we've learned a lot about corps as we as we started uh there's, there's two reasons for that the first one is we didn't really know that dot corp like existed um when we started uh gates of council gave us a uh startup advisor who hadn't really worked with corps before um so it's a good idea. I the other way it does it does cost more than a .co.uk domain. Um, if you want, I think in my head I decide the co stands for co-op, so that, that works for me. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a decision that we yeah we 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 haven't we haven't sort of uh, refactored that. It, we might decide to go for that in the future, uh, but for the moment that's that's where we're at. Cool. Well, John, thank you very much. You've uh, you're exactly on time, you've, you, and you've covered a, a huge amount there. And I was particularly interested in some of the things you're saying about the um, the link between uh, transparency and um, ensuring that the cooperative is because you don't have those issues about um, pretense, pretending to the boss or whatever. You can actually work in a much more transparent, much more professional way. So I think really, really interesting insights there. Yep. Cool. So thank you very much. We'd like to pass um, pass over to Mark now, Mark Porter from the PDF in here in Preston. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon. Um, I've obviously got one of my co-conspirators buried in the crowd. Um, so um, Andrew, do you want to flip your camera on? Because hopefully he's going to wingman me a um, ably as usual. Yeah, give us just a second. <laughs> 
turn on some lights. So this is proper uh, co-op teamwork here. Yeah, so it's a highly coordinated group of people. Hey, hi. obligatory hat. Hey, Andy. Of course I am. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, it's really interesting following on from John because um, I would classify us as a park baked co-op at the moment. Uh, we're in a transitory period, um, and I think Rachel was going to to be talking about the sort of level of support that that the council has been um, giving to co-ops locally in Preston as part of the Preston model. Because my other hat, um, I'm one of the directors of the Preston Cooperative Development Network, so I sort of um, I'm, I'm very embedded in in the co-op culture locally um and and also uh, between between the two roles it's a sort of um a poacher gamekeeper sort of um relationship but i'm very very interested in developing co-ops um, as, as a way of supporting local business and an alternative form of employment and, and more of that in a minute so Andrew here is a, is, a, is a member of the PDF as well um, and one of the fellow directors. So probably some of the points that John was making before will sound fairly familiar, but I think we're, we're at a different point in our journey. And I'm, I'm hoping at the end that, that Polly will be, Polly, I think he's more, more of an established and polished cooperative than ours at the moment. So uh, I'll leave that there. So there'll be some echoing things. So I will try and share my screen successfully. Yes, he can. Cool. Is that working? Yep. Cool. Um, so same thing. We're a co-op um, and we specialize in digital services, um, which is no surprise from the webinar title. Um, but we are a little bit different because the way we came into being and what we do is very much um, product of our environment. So uh, the title, as some of you in the industry will know, is a little bit of a play on words for a certain uh, American software company's digital document format. Um, nice, catchy, and memorable. But it was really a case of trying to describe how, how we were as a company in digital, but also um, making the most of our title. So we've, we are... Uh, a foundation and, and one of the things that John was talking about and, and, is, and is really part of our story is it's quite tricky to become a co-op because it's although it's a well-established business model and, and as Rachel said going back over 150 years when you start talking to the government and other regulatory bodies it suddenly becomes something that's not normal so we actually when we were um, going through um, creating the, the sort of legal entity we actually had a bit of a battle on with a company's house um, because they said we weren't a foundation and we said well we're, we're going to be a co-op and one of our things is that we are not for profit and also we really really do want to actually give money away and again these sort of concepts seem quite alien to them so we done actually took us about six months right in the beginning of covid as well so we had to put in forms and and one of the things we discovered about starting a co-op in the uk is um it's still a paper-based process and it's only become a digital process because of of covid and lockdown um in fact we ended up duplicate we have a spare co-op because of those circumstances so we really started out um trying to create a co-op um because of, of the ethos but we found that the journey has been quite challenging um and this is where i can flip back to my pcdn hat, hat and where is the one of our goals is to make becoming a co-op a lot more straightforward so our story is about essentially working as a university. In fact, uh, the thing with Polly, it was in fact outlandish that gave us the idea of creating a co-op um, based around the um, the state of the talent pool in Preston. And uh, Laurie introduced us um, um, and mentioned Digital Lancashire. Well, again, I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with that organization and I talk quite a few of them. So we've sort of been embedded in the digital industry within Lancashire for quite a while. And what happened was that we have people coming out of the university who don't necessarily want to have conventional employment. They don't necessarily get the job they want or um, you know, there is there is some development of their personal skills and circumstances that means that conventional employment probably doesn't suit them. Um, so this has been an ongoing thing because my background is uh, teaching. And we, we basically used to do a lot of projects within the university and lots of student projects and then students would leave and then the clients would come back um, and go like, well, we'd like more of this and it's terrific. So we had a really good talent pool that we, you know, that was still 
wanting to stay local, but maybe there wasn't the, the job opportunity. So it sort of came up over a, a period of time. I taught enterprise modules. Um, so I taught commercial modules where we worked as a, as a small agency. So out of that, um, and a meeting uh, with a couple of outlandish members, we thought, well, let's do a co-op. And, and it sort of snowballed from there. So as soon as we mentioned we were doing this, we got we, we ended up with a lot of people going, well, actually, do you know what? I'd like to do that. I'd like to work flexibly. Um, you know, there's quite a few members that still work within the university on a full time basis. Andy's one of them. But there's, we got asked for so many different bits of work and we wanted sort of a little bit more um, autonomy with some of the work as well. And obviously we wanted continuation of service for um, people that had already um, had projects done within the university. So that's sort of how we came to being. And the other thing about that is, you know, if you're going to work for yourself, you want it to be equitable. I'm, I'm my previous life. I've been a company director for a, um, a traditional company in manufacturing before I, I became an academic. Um, so it's sort of my background in um, sort of conventional business. And and one of the things I wanted to do if I was working for myself again is do it differently. Um, and so it's sort of been sort of a, this really interesting evolving journey and like you say you 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 start down the road of can i you know, how do how do i do business differently well the co-op model came on who's who wants to work in it um but also part of it was really to try and give something back to the local community so the backbone behind this is trying to to retain local talent and also give back locally so this is sort of you know that that sense of community from the preston model um, there's a rainbow bench there for a reason. I haven't got the press release, but that's actually our first community gift. Um, um, we we have associated with Sue Ryder Homes through a personal contact. And I'm going back to what John was saying, uh, my most sort of small enterprises, we rely on word of mouth. Um, so a rainbow bench has been um, installed last week, I believe. And Dave, was it? it was last week, was it the week before? Uh, I think it was a week before, actually. Okay, we're waiting for the press release on that. So we paid for that out of the digital work we've done, our foundation status. And um, so those of you who are definitely not local, um, it's it's a neurological care unit that's not part of the NHS. So it's a, it's a, it's a charity. And they've just moved to a new state-of-the-art facility. Um, and it's pretty bare. So we've, we've uh, donated this bench so that the... Um, the patients and the visitors can have um, a place to go. And, and it's also um, part of our thanks for people um, working in the NHS as well. So that's actually our first tangible output from our co-op. So that's really what we're in it for. We wanted a business model where we can, um, you know, work how we want. And, and maybe Andy, you want to you wanna add why you, you joined? <laughs> Uh, why? Why I specifically joined? Yeah, I mean, it it gave it gave us like a lot of freedom to do a lot more stuff as well as you know, like we're able to expand our knowledge, we're able to work on these interesting projects, like aside from what we're doing normally with work. So, like the fact that it was generally like a part time thing was quite an advantage for me, I think. Yeah, I was to say because I think the, the thing about us and maybe the other co-ops is that we're everybody works part time with it. There is no full time staff at the moment, and they say our journey is getting going with the co-op. Um, so um, going back to the common theme, yep, yeah, uh, one person, one vote. We have a core membership, we have an associate membership, but we're actually slightly different, and we're working through the governance. And I'll go back to the OFS ten support in a bit, but essentially, we want to attract students to work with us while they're at university. So we, we're um, um, again, this is an outlandish phrase. We're a unicube. So one of the things we have different in our governance is that we have a um, a model for student representation. So in other words, if you are a undergraduate or postgraduate as a group and come and work for us that you will have a representative voice just as you would do if you were a, a member of a course. So even if we're going to be working with students on uh, projects, they will still have an input into um, how, um, how we run the show. So same thing as everybody else, the 
best thing about running a co-op, and I think John was saying this as well, is you get to work with people. You know, it's a wonderful way of, of finding out whether or not it's a good fit because it is a non-hierarchical structure. So we we like the model of, of being able to work together. The original founding members had already worked together on, on projects and we're attracting new members now and it's going to be the same model. Come and work with us. Do does you know are you good for us and are we good for you? I think it's a fantastic way of of building a company and all the advantages that uh, John said and presumably Polly will echo after this. Um, so we've currently got six, seven members. It's it's actually growing. I think we're we're acquiring somebody new this week. I haven't met them yet, um, but our other uh, other our director Dom is on leave. So we we are diverse in terms of skill set, but we're also diverse in terms of of background and ethnicity. And and I think that's a wonderful thing. And one of the core um, attractions for us is we are not conventional, and therefore there isn't that sort of um, predisposition to a particular group of people, or you know, say the the lack of hierarchy um, in that sense. The no boss angle is is particularly attractive to people, and also the fact that you you get listened to. So currently our team um, looks like this, and hopefully this slide will be very out of date within the next month as we will be uh, gaining new members. And again, going back to, we would like to do more things. We're ge getting asked to do different projects with different skills, and therefore we would like to use our very flexible model to essentially get people involved we also have a flexible payment model as well which is quite interesting so sometimes people want to work on jobs but don't really want to be paid all at once for various circumstances so we even allow people to do work within you know as P as pdf members and then decide when they want to get paid so we're, we're playing with that sort of model um so what we've been up to um we're sort of a a, a mid low end uh, at the moment with the skill set so we've been working on other community projects uh, from co-op so with team lies we've done virtual reality uh, simulations for teaching materials we've done user experience work for the student union and we also work on some of the projects within the university to uh, essentially help them build digital um solutions where there isn't an option to go to a, a full external commercial company because of budgets or there there is no in-house expertise so again our projects at the moment are very diverse and part of our growth plan is to sort of work out where our specialism should be um, but again the flexibility of the membership model and the way the co-op's running uh, means that we should be able to cope with that quite well um, and we, we've got a lot of people supporting us. So I'm going to go back to the, the bit. So we've been uh, one of the co-ops through the OSF 10, which has meant there's been seed funding on top of um, support we got from the Hive, which means we've been able to um, get support in the things that we're not good at. So maybe like some of the other people go, we're good at the day job. We, we, you know, we're very good at our digital skills. However, apart from myself, none of the other members have one run a company and two none of us have run a co-op so having support at an early stage has been absolutely vital for us so we've got um, um, government governance workshops um, like John was saying we need to know how to make good decisions in a non-hierarchical way so consensus opinion making so we're currently planning some workshops so we all get the hang of how to do that um, and still maintain a good working relationships and we know those are the challenges um, going down to the, the more mundane things like what's the what's the business model? We're we're a company limited uh, by guarantee. We we need specialist uh, contracts for working uh, with the industry and the sort of products we're planning. Um, and and things like our new products are going to be we're going to be flying some drones around as well. So we're really diverse in what we do. But the support for actually working out how to run the core business has been has been really really important for us and joining networks like Cotech and we're, we're very quietly in the corner at the moment because we are part way through our co-op journey we are very much looking at you know making sure that our our business runs effectively by taking on enough work that we can cope with rather than you know promising the earth and then finding we're, we're very stressed and and can't deliver quality so we're very very you know focused on are we a good business first? It's also then wonderful that we're a co-op because of all the benefits that we're going to be talking about. We've got the downsides, which is 
you know, it's a slightly trickier business model than a conventional business. And obviously, um, you know, the the ability to make quick decisions by you know, somebody being in charge, it's gone. But I think that's an absolute positive from our concern because hopefully other people will do. Everybody volunteers. So even on the smallest jobs, um, I work as commercial director because that's my experience. I will go in and scope and work on the jobs, but the teams are self-assembled. And if we've, we've got a shortage of a skill, we'll, we'll use our network to get people on board. Um, or if it's way outside of our scope, we will pass it on to um, other people in the network, whether that's Digital Lancashire, Co Cotec or whatever. Um, so it's been really, it's been a very interesting year for us. I don't know if Andrew wants to add anything into that. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, like you were saying before about actually setting up the cooperative, that's been like the main focus since basically the start of lockdown. I think it was just before that we were starting to get get the ball rolling. But then obviously with lockdown, you know, it's been, it's been a bit of a slow ride, hasn't it? <laughs> Well, yeah, it's like anything else. It's, it's made something that's quite a complicated process a little bit longer. But as I say, I think we, we are now, in fact, we are now scheduled in to actually meet up as a team for the first time in the year. Um, yep. The other thing about it is one of our members has actually got a full time job in a conventional company off the back of coming in and working on uh, a part time project. And that's that's what they wanted to do. However, the, the good news is that she wants to remain a member of the PDF and help and mentor other people. And if the, the you know, the PDF grows to a, a particular size that we can support a full time job, I'm sure she'll be back. And in, in the meantime, you know, it can be we can use our vehicle as a stepping stone to other careers for people or you work within the PDF because that's what you want to do. So, again, that's been sort of the fantastic part of it. And also the challenge is about how do you manage that level of um, employment flexibility and to maintain um, consistency and quality of service uh, within the industry that we do. Um, so yeah, we're we're sort of we're part way there um, with our journey. It's been it's been good so far. We've we've um, delivered all our projects mostly on time, thanks to a good team effort and the rest of the world um, slowing things down um, and. And, and really, I suppose that's the point where I, I'd like to stop talking and, and hopefully people have some questions. Thanks very much, Mark and, and Andrew. That's been really, really interesting. And I think all those links you're making with um, the university and with graduates coming in and, and being with you for a time to get experience and then moving on I think it, it, it gives a really good impression of, of the multiple roles that a cooperative can play um, and, and with your links to the university we can see how that's really shaped shape your offer and shape your approach so uh, I just absolutely <laughs> we, we like a bit of complexity <laughs> uh... I've got somebody asking for the contact details again did you did you provide them Mark could you just pop those into your Yes, I will pop those into the chat. Pop those into the chat. Uh, have we got any other questions for Mark or Andrew? Ah, there we are. Polly, how do salaries work at the co-op? Are students and graduates paid at a commercial rate for the work they do? Oh, yes. Or does participation fall into one of their courses? No, 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 no. This is, this is for real money. Um, there's a lot of, I think that the, as an experienced teach, uh, academic, we get what's known as a lot of tire kickers. It will be wonderful for you. You know how the speech goes. This will be wonderful for exposure or your portfolio. And, and, and given the amount of money that students have to pay for being students, now we go, we would be much better if they could be paid and eat. Um, so one of our rules is it's academic credit. So yeah, if you need to bring in a live project, you're either putting it towards an assignment, which you have to do anyway, but more than not, we'd like to pay you. Um, and one of the other models we have is, uh, you know, we do have a pay spine and we pay more than the living wage because again, our talent pool should be paid well. Um, and, and because of the way that we are funded, again, we're, I'm going to say completely plagiarized from outlandish. Um, 
is the fact that we would like you to be really expensive. We, you know, if you are talented and we can get a market rate for you, the the, the good thing, I suppose, it's you would classify as a non-extractive working agreement. If we can charge more for you, you get more. So um, one of the things, even a standard internship in you uh, within the university, we pay more than that. You know, we would like you to work for us. Um, certainly with the rates that we've been paying people, even though it's part time, you know, we are paying industry rates and we want to continue to do that. And, and one of the other things that we're integrating within our co-op is a proper uh, professional development and mentoring program because again there's a lot of demand and we've got experienced members and we've got junior members um, and what we want to do is is support people to actually grow their skills and and their opportunities and their market value so yeah um, we you know that's exactly what we want to do we want we would like to charge as much as possible so each of the members gets that reward. And as I say, you know, one of the things we are doing and we've started to do it already, which is wonderful, is, is start giving some of that uh, excess away in a very tangible, um, very tangible fashion. Mark, we've got a couple more questions uh, yeah. about your service offer. So what services do you offer? And then a specific question about do you offer services to support evaluation, research, and measuring of projects? Um, not at the moment. Again, it's, it's one of those growth things. So we have a, um, uh, an established talent pool because we have the original members in who are from a sort of digital creative technology background. Um, and one of the things that we're going to be doing as an exercise is looking at what is the demand for digital services. As you said, within COVID, it's exploded. I'm actually middle of writing an article for a publication about the uptake of e-commerce um, and one of the things we're looking for is you know what what services are needed um, and obviously one of our flexible offerings is that we'll, we'll see if we can find somebody who would like that sort of opportunity and as long as we can do quality work and delivery as a normal company was you know we'll say yes um, but it's part of our growing and re uh, review processes to look at the the services, I mean, as I said, we're, we're one of the ones that we're growing at the moment is um, we're going to have two qualified drone pilots for filming and other media work, which sounds very unrelated to websites. But again, that's the, the talent pool equipment and, and skill set we have. But um, yeah. Well, you might have answered the question from earlier, earlier on. What sort of work do you do? I think you've given us a sense of that. And who is a typical client? What um, is your... USP. Well, typical client at the moment is one of the things we started off with. So there's actually quite a lot of in-house work within the university and associated through through PCD. And so like most startup companies, we, we're working with people who know us um, and then sort of growing our, our client base. We've we've got, um, in fact, Andy, you, it's one of your contacts has come back to us this last week, hasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So that's um, uh, this contact that he's on about. Um, essentially, he gets a lot of other projects through that he's not able to take on himself so he's going to be passing them on to us so that's going to be a quite a decent stream of projects we believe uh, and this is it you know in terms of how do you we're trying to grow it's a bit like the search engine optimization at the moment we're trying to grow organically through the demand and again because of the way that we're set up you know, we, we can we can be flexible around the amount of resources we put on a project or not put on a project. So, um, as I say, because we're sort of coming to the end of it's the our end of our first financial year, actually, at the end of this month. So we've actually had a test run for a year, obviously, under very weird circumstances. And then next year we will be more strategic around the offering and, and membership. Well, thank you very much, Mark and Andrew. That's been really interesting uh, and I think because you're early in your journey I think you've given us some insight into what it takes to set up a co-op in this in this sector we will at the end I'm going to say a little bit more about the references that Mark made to the support that's available for Preston-based um, worker cooperatives if they wish to set themselves up we have a program of, of, of support technical support for for those um, cooperatives as they seek to get on their feet but before we before I uh, do that I, I'd like to invite Polly to talk a little bit about her cooperative and also about the work of Cotec which brings digital cooperatives together in a cooperative community. Uh, 
Right, hi everybody. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. It's great to see some people here. Um, so, I'm Polly Robbins, and I work for a uh, worker co-op called Outlandish. We're based in London, uh, North London, in Finsbury Park. Um, we started as a as a as a straight up business as a company limited by guarantee um in uh 2007 i believe and uh, morphed into being a cooperative in 2016. um we thought it was kind of it represented like our values much better and in practice we had been kind of working as a cooperative but it just wasn't really enshrined in our kind of legal articles of association um when we transformed into a cooperative um as as many of you will know one of the principles of cooperativism is that you cooperate with other co-ops and so we started searching around um at that time to find out which other co-ops existed in the digital sector um particularly workers cooperatives and we kind of suggested to those that we did find that we all get together um and that was back in 2016 we got together in Wortley hall which is a um, it's like a stately home, which I believe is uh, now owned by the TUC or Unite um, up outside Sheffield. And that was the birth of Kotec. So I'm here um, not to talk to you so much about Outlandish, but rather to talk to you about Kotec. Um, so we're a network, network of workers cooperatives um, and we all sell technology or digital services. Um, we started with about 20 co-op members came to that inaugural meeting and we've now got around 45 members. So each one of those member, each, each one of those co-ops has anything between I think two or three to uh, I'd say about 40 uh, workers within it. So we're representing I think something like around um, 300 workers. And that's all across the UK, including Wales and Scotland, and in fact, I think Northern Ireland. Um, so we have three main ways of working together. John has touched on some of them. John, as you know, is also part of Kotec. So I'd say the first and foremost, um, one of the main things about Kotec is that it's a business network and we collaborate on projects. Um, and so that's like a really, quite an unusual thing to do. Um, as co-ops, we try not to compete against each other. It's kind of, it's not really in our, in our interests or vision for lots of co-ops to be competing for the same kind of work, particularly when that work comes from public sector bodies or charities and trade unions and that kind of thing. Um, so we will try to kind of partner um, on projects. So for example, we might work with Cooperative when we need some additional skills or specialisms. We do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning as well, um, which is just like a really lovely thing to do because, you know, as John mentioned, it's not always the, I don't think everybody's mentioned it's not, and Mark's also mentioned, it's not always the easiest thing to do to set up a co-op. So where, where it's possible, we try to share as uh, many learnings as we can. We also um, have like a high level of transparency when it comes to things like policies and procedures. Anybody could say, oh, you know, I need a, you know, uh, we, we're redeveloping our paternity and we're Paternity pay um, policy. What should we do? And we'll, we've we've got a kind of repository where we keep all of those things. Um, we do a few secondments. That's something which has been growing um, recently. Um, so at the moment, at Outlandish, we're working with three. No, sorry, four members of other co-ops. So that was partly because in the summer um, we needed some extra capacity. Like quite a few people, partly due to COVID and lots of parents uh, lots of people at outlandish are parents and so they were only working part-time but the schools were off and things we just needed a bit of extra capacity so we reached out to a couple of designers and also project managers from other co-ops and they're now working with us on a comment um part-time the great thing about that is that um it means that we can it means that we don't have that gap in uh, in our staffing and it also means that other co-ops are now learning more about how our processes work. And so then when it comes next time to collaborating or partnering on a client project, we, we can kind of hit the ground running. They know about our processes. We know about theirs. We know each other much better in terms of like the skills and interests that we have. And then thirdly, we collectively support the digital co-op sector to grow. So, um, for example, that would be providing internships to young people, working with universities, coming and talking at um, events like this and that kind of thing. So that's probably what, what Cotec is. Um, we, we, I'm not going to read this out, but uh, 
we really do believe that there is like an alternative way to for the tech industry to work. Um, I've recently been running a, um, a training program for people wanting to learn new digital skills, kind of basic digital skills. And I was had a really great conversation with a woman who said, oh, it's so great to hear, read your website. I've only ever thought technology is something which is really exploitative. And I, you hear so much about Facebook and Google and all of this lot in the news, stealing our data, uh, spying on people or dropping bombs on people and things. And she said it was just so inspiring to hear that there was an alternative vision for the tech industry, which isn't based around um, exploitation of workers or exploitation of users in the form of kind of data and that kind of thing. Um, we really want to kind of show and demonstrate, not just through talking about it, but actually kind of operating in such a way that it does provide uh, workers with like a greater level of control over their over their like working day and working life, as well as like who their clients are. And also that our clients feel that they can really Trust us, I think, is a really important um, part of being a workers' cooperative. Uh, as a cooperative, as John mentioned, everybody who works with that cooperative owns the business. And so we each have like a vested interest in our business and our reputation. We're not just kind of in one day and out the other. And so if you work with the workers' cooperative, then you're working with a business owner. You're always working with, you know, the top top bosses if you like if you like um and yeah we just want to kind of demonstrate that you know another world is is possible it's not about um exploitation um this is just a few of our uh, this is the co-op members um we work across like a whole bunch of different creative um creative specialisms so everything from um design and development to kind of strategy and everything um, this is just a few of the uh, of the clients. There are many more if you go on our website. So as you can see, we work a lot with um, universities and uh, sort of educational and research organisations. Uh, we work with a lot of NGOs and charities, um, public sector, that kind of thing. Um, it's not actually represented very well on this slide, but we also work with um, with a lot of companies um, in Outland. Every co-op has its own policies, but um, in Outlandish, we actually quite like working for companies. Like we have a bit of a Robin Hood model because if you're always working with, um, with charities or NGOs, they probably already have some kind of ethical buying policy. And so that it's inevitable that the money that they spend is almost certainly going to get spent with a kind of somewhat ethical digital agency. Maybe they might not be straight up a co-op. Um, whereas if you're working with um, a pensions provider or something, it's unlikely that they will have necessarily thought about that when it comes to procuring their digital services. And so outlandish, we, we don't work with any arms companies. Um, we don't work with any kind of fossil fuels industries. And, you know, we do it on a case by case basis. We, we, we turn down work with um, the home office and the foreign office. Um, but broadly, we work with like quite a, a large range of companies as well, as long as they are more or less trying to do good stuff. Um, and another thing to mention about Outlandish is we try to make a 20% surplus. We don't call it a profit. We try to make a 20% surplus on all of our projects. Um, so not all of the money is paid out in, in pay to, to our workers. We keep 20% of it back. And we try to invest that in projects which we think use technology to make the world a better place. So sometimes that might be doing pro bono work for our clients. Um, sometimes it might be taking people on who we know we can't charge out very, at very high rates, but we want to train them up. And particularly when that's about um, diversity and inclusion. So training up young female uh, developers, and that kind of thing to try and tackle some of the gender imbalance in, in the tech sector. And um, one thing that we have done, which I'll talk about, uh, in a moment is setting up a, a co-working space, uh, which one is one of the main projects that I do at Outlandish, which is trying to stimulate the digital co-op sector. Um, so yeah, as I've touched on, it's, it's really about being greater than the sum of our parts. Most of the co-ops are, um, I think the top one is about 40 people, but mostly they range for about, about 10 people or something. And I think I speak for, pretty much all members of the co-op uh, of the network when I say that we don't want to grow and grow. Um, when you think about startups in the traditional sense, sort of tech startups, there is always a kind of expectation that you ought to be growing and uh, increasing your turnover kind of somewhat exponentially and uh, buying up other companies and growing your team massively. 
most co-ops don't really want that. They like kind of being quite friendly with the rest of their members. They like kind of having that personal touch and keeping that kind of culture of it being a small business. Um, but at the same time, that means that we, previous to being, prior to being a co-op, we couldn't necessarily say, oh yeah, well, you know, okay, we're going to build this great website for you, but we don't really know how to promote it on, on Facebook. You'll have to find a different agency to do that. Whereas now with, co uh, with Cotech, what we can do is we can each kind of work uh, according to our specialisms and then partner up with other co-ops um, in line with their specialisms. Um, so, for example, we worked on a big project um, for uh, UNICEF where we created the data visualization and the data tools and um, another co-op worked on like the actual embedding it into a Drupal website because we don't specialize in that. We've also partnered up with other um, co-ops to do kind of comms and, and like uh, a kind of comms and marketing strategy for um, a lot of the projects that we've worked on. And we, we've worked, we collaborated on projects worth up to 2.2 .2 million, I think is one of the biggest ones. So we're not all just, you know, tiddly little um, tiny businesses working on small projects. We are actually trying to kind of get a bigger and bigger share of the kind of tech market. Um, and yeah, we, we cover a whole range of specialisms. Um, oh, I missed one, no, sorry. Um, so, so of course, you know, Preston is one of, you know, leading the way in terms of trying to support co-ops. Um, and I think that, you know, just as a few kind of, you know, suggestions, which are, you know, it's not rocket science, is about training. So um, for example, like one of the members of Cotech is called Founders and Coders. Um, they're a, a completely free uh, coding school. They teach people for um, 12 weeks, and I think that's going up to 18. Um, completely free full-time course and how to become a JavaScript developer. And then they have partnerships with a lot of employers. So that's kind of tech startups, other co-ops, um, some government uh, as well. And they're kind of, they're also transforming into becoming an official apprenticeship provider. And so just trying to boost the level of digital skills within a city or a town or a region, I think is like really important. Um, it is, it's only gonna grow as a sector. And it currently provides, you know, the tech sector provides very highly paid jobs compared to a lot of other sectors. So I do think that like trying to stimulate digital training programs, particularly when they can be free and inclusive um, to people who aren't traditionally uh, well employed in the tech sector is really important. Business training and, you know, events like this. Um, it's about, you know, there's a lot of training out there as, as far as I can see about how to run a startup or how to how to run um even a social enterprise, but they do tend to be more geared towards at least being like partly profit making um, and just trying to give people the training that's needed um, about how to run a co-op. It is, um, there is like a lack of that across the country. And that's definitely something that Cotech can help with. Spreading the word, doing events like this and affordable workspaces. So I mentioned that um, we set up something called Space 4. It's an affordable work training and event space in North London. Um, I think we've incubated, so, so we've been going for three, four years now, uh, I think we've incubated something like eight co-ops, um, and we also have founders and coders, that code school I mentioned, housed within the workspace, so they are kind of submerged, if you like, into this kind of world of, of co-ops. Um, we also do a lot of events for the local people and, and beyond about what co-ops are and kind of the intersection of kind of politics, philosophy and technology, looking at things not, not always specific to the co-op industry, but for example, uh, we did an event a couple of years ago, which I loved, which is about um, uh, gender and LGBTQ issues when it comes to tech, so looking at ethics and sort of uh, AI and all of that kind of stuff. And so looking again at these kind of ethical questions, which are really prevalent in the tech sector. Um, we're next for co for Cotech, so we want to keep on growing in terms of our members. So if you hear of any co-ops that you think could do with some support and be part of a wider network, please put them in touch. Um, we also want to grow our turnover, so we're always looking for clients, and that's anything between sort of five thousand pounds and five million pounds, something like that. We would like to see more and more um, cooperative workspaces incubated, so like, like the Space 4 project that I've uh, mentioned. And there are a few popping up around the country, including in Newcastle and Bradford, um, and we'd like to see a lot more of that. And that can really, really be supported when it comes to um, if, you, if you work for a council or a local borough, or if you are indeed any kind of property developer, things like that. Um, 
it would be great to think about who could who could kind of be in that workspace and be generating a lot of value because one of another one of the core principles is that you invest in your local community so spending some money with a co-op or um or giving them some free workspace is likely to be reinvested back into the into the local community we'd like to see more business schools um talk about co-ops so you know if again like if you are part of business school um don't just talk about profit driven companies talk about co-ops as well um, we're in the process of developing more formal training programs for young people and people who are the, new to the co-op sector. Um, and we're getting the Young Cooperators Network, which was um, it was set up a few years ago and is now somewhat fallen by the wayside. So that's getting reinvigorated at the moment. We're currently thinking about appointing a network coordinator for Cotec. Um, Cotec currently is quite decentralized, um, which is great in some ways because it kind of somehow reflects like the co-op model where everybody has to pitch in to make it a success. Um, but we're also thinking about appointing like a new business development lead for the Cotec network, um, who would kind of be in charge of going out there and getting more business and collaborating internationally. Um, and as John mentioned, we are part of a whole international movement which goes right around the globe. Um, so that's it for me. Um, there's a little bit of information there for you to get in touch. And yeah, be very happy to take any questions that you've got. Thanks. Thank you very much, Polly. Um, we, I've picked up one question in the chat. What process do you use to disseminate the work fairly across the cooperative? Um, so at the moment, what we do is we, uh, we, we meet quite regularly and we have an online forum. Um, and so we kind of get to know, because it's still only 45 co-ops, we do get to know roughly what the specialisms are for each co-op. Um, and so we try to refer work when it's to, to the people that it's relevant to, rather than just kind of putting it out there and broadcasting it, because that can result in things not going, coming, coming back or going quite to the right co-op or um, the client just kind of reaches a bit of a, a kind of impasse when it comes to somebody picking, picking it up. So one way is that we just do kind of direct referrals. Um, another way is that we have a discourse forum where jobs go up and the co-ops can kind of talk about who, who's most um, eligible for the work and who's most in need of the work. We are, we've just started using a platform which has been developed by our kind of counterparts in France um, who are called uh, Happy Dev. And they have created a piece of software called Hubble which allows you to um, build teams around a particular project. Um, so we've, we've only just started using that. Um, but yes, we try to, as far as possible, not compete against each other. And if there are two organizations who want to go for the same work, um, it's, we, we try to get them to collaborate and take on different aspects of that work together or look at it on a needs based, uh, in a needs-based way. So which co-op co actually needs that work most. Thank you. Have we got any more questions for Polly? Well, thank you very much, Polly. Um, I, th I think, again, the what you were saying about the community of cooperatives, I think there were some really, really important messages there about the mutual support and trust and the personal relationships that operate between you as a, as a community. Uh, and supporting you to collaborate rather than compete. And I, I think there's a very powerful messages to, to take away from, from this afternoon because it is, a, it is a totally different working culture. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure for many of those listening that will have, have great appeal. So before we, before we finish, I'm sure you'd like to all like to join me in thanking today's speakers for their inspiring contributions. I would also like to thank everyone else who's contributed to today's events. We've had um, Alina particularly, who's worked very hard to get us set up and various comms teams who've been uh, broadcasting the message about the webinars. And of course, thank you to all of you who've joined us today. And I hope you found it worthwhile and, and an inspiring afternoon. Uh, I did say, say a little bit about the support we have available in Preston for worker co-ops at a sort of startup phase. We have some funding from the Open Societies Foundations, uh, uh, sorry, the Open Society Foundation, which is, is provides up to 10 days of technical support for a, co a worker cooperative in those early days of getting 
getting ready to launch. So if you are in Preston South River Law Chorley and you're interested in pursuing a cooperative project, you do get in touch with us. Um, I think Alina will put in the chat the email to get more information about that funding programme. And the other thing I just wanted to say is that we do have another webinar next week. We're continuing the Preston model, those digital theme, but with a slightly different focus. It overlaps, but it's, it's a slightly different focus because we're going to be talking about platform cooperatives, uh, how cooperative ownership of digital platforms is creating a more diverse and democratic economy. And we'll be introducing uh, some pioneers from the northwest of England who are transforming platform capitalism into platform cooperativism and I did I, we had a little chat a chat earlier with Zola from Mon Mongolia I believe um, about the open food net and Lynn Davis who who uh, is the chief executive of the open food net will be presenting about that particular piece of software which is I believe an open source software and has been used in other parts of the world so um, Zolo, it might be well worth joining us for that webinar next week. So once again, thanks to everybody for a really interesting afternoon and wishing you all very well. And if you wish to get into con in contact with us, please do. Alina's just put the um, the email in the chat for the for the OSF funding. But any other questions, do get in touch. Uh, or I think you have the details of the different speakers that have been provided. I'm sure they would be willing to follow up with any questions that you may have. So once again, many thanks and best wishes to all. <laughs>